people now come here to get rich. 20 years ago, theoretically, this was a city built on public service. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we are talking with Mark Leibovich. He is the author of the controversial and highly publicized book, This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral, Plus Plenty of Valet Parking in America's Gilded Capital. Mark, thanks for talking to us. Nick, good to be here. Okay, you are at the New York Times Magazine. You've been a Washington Post reporter, San Jose Mercury News. You, you have covered this town for a long time. This town. Uh, and uh, there's a, certainly a lot in this book for a Washington hater to grab onto. I mean, uh, you, uh, you know, Tim Russert's funeral is like a scene from Fellini. Uh, but you, it is easy to come away thinking that you love this town. I don't love this town. I, I've been looking for an excuse to live elsewhere for many years. Um, the fact is, I mean, my job is here, my wife's job is here, our kids are here, our life is here, our schools are here. I'm pretty sure if you move, the kids will follow. You know, I don't you know, know if the, the wife, wife will, maybe not, and that could be interesting. No, I mean, look, it, it's, I, it's a nice place to raise a family, very pleasant. Um, and we're all very lucky in our employment and stuff. Who are the who are the status brokers in DC currently? Who are the people? Because in a lot of ways, this book it's it's about cocktail parties. It's about who gets the valet the best valet parking slot. Right. Who shows up at Tim Russert's funeral? Right. Uh, who are the big status players right now? I mean, first of all, I mean, I think the major point of the book is that government and Washington and the whole entourage of Washington has gotten so big that really the barriers to entry in the status game have sort of fallen through the floor, and anyone you know, without facial warts can go on cable and be called a strategist and all of a sudden you're, you're doing paid speeches and so forth. So, I mean, I guess one person I focus on is Bob Barnett, who's a, a lawyer in town, represents Democrats, Republicans, broadcast journalists. I mean, he's, he calls himself the doorman of the revolving door. Uh, which is pretty interesting. He doesn't say. And it. Uh, give us names of some of his clients. Uh, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, George W. Bush, Laura Bush, Dick Cheney, Sarah Palin, right. and you know the, the, the Clintons. Goes, and he represents everyone. Talk about what is the connection between status and power? Because and are people in D.C. are they after status or are they after power? Um, I don't know, some combination of both. I mean, I certainly, increasingly, they're after money. I mean, Washington is the wealthiest community in the United States right now. It's, it's home to seven of the wealthiest ten counties right. in the United States. And that and reason we chart that with, with alarm. As I imagine you should. Yeah. I think most people right. should. And I think, I mean, it part of, obviously a big part of this is the growth of government, but, but a lot of it is the derivative sectors around the growth of government, whether it's lobbying, uh, any number of consulting things. And, and look, I mean, I, I think one of the biggest changes here over the last couple of decades is that people now come here to get rich. Twenty years ago, theoretically, this was a city built on public service. Um, I think it's been given over to self-service and sort of feeding it a much broader trough. Are people in Washington the people who actually make the big differences in everyday life? Um, and are the people who are seeking status here, are they the ones who are creating the, uh, the context for the invasion of Syria? Mm -hmm. Are they the ones who are telling the NSA you know, start looking at everything we're doing. Or, you know, is this where it all happens? And then how does that feed back into the kind of spectacular carnival? Right. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I think, first of all, I mean, I tried not to focus too much on the trivial players. I mean, some might say that, okay, I focus on a party host here and, a, and an agent right. here and everyone's sort of operating and, and that's, um, you know, they're, they're really not known to people. But I think ultimately it begins with the government. I mean, when you have someone like Tom Daschle, who's one of the most powerful Democrats in Washington, you know, leaves the Senate, voted out of the Senate, is now one of the most powerful you know, corporate consultants. He would never call himself a lobbyist right. or a strategic consultant, whatever he calls himself. Still obviously talks to his former Senate colleagues every day. And now he could not become the Secretary of Health and Human Services, though, right? I um, mean, he, right. He had um, some tax problems. So what, uh, yeah, and he obviously, or he realized that his compensation actually included what he was being paid, not yes. just <laughs> what he decided to declare. Yeah, there was a limo thing. But, you right. know, so is he, pa is, I mean, is that a sign that he's very powerful, um, or is it a sign that actually these people want to believe that they're powerful, but they're being dictated to? Great distinction. I mean, first of all, these people want to believe they're powerful, but more importantly, people People want to believe that they're powerful and they hire them. I mean, we're talking about billions in, in corporate, in trade, in government money that is going to ultimately support a sector. I mean, I guess the term I would use, I mean, Tom Coburn, who's one of the characters in this book. Is, one of the heroes, are I like to think so. I, look, I, yeah. I mean, I love talking to Tom Coburn. Yeah. I think Tom Coburn has a great view of what the big picture here is. And his word for it is the permanent feudal class of Washington, D.C. And 
Um, I think that's a great way of putting it. It's just this sprawling, I mean, he says, it's a, you know, he talks about parasitisms and he compares it to the intestines and he's a doctor, so he gets all, 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 all colorful. Like, and he's famous for giving a, a, a slideshow, a PowerPoint presentation of STDs to uh, uh, DC interns. So he, yeah. he can really go with he the can, image, Yes, yeah. he, subtlety has never yeah. been one of his things. But no, but, but yeah. Dr. Coburn or Senator Coburn is someone who um, I think has really named this in a way that, that I was very, very uh, taken by. Do you think Coburn, is he exemplary in the sense that he, I mean, he's somebody uh, who has definite principles. Mm -hmm. He's willing to negotiate on things mm -hmm. that aren't central or even, you know, that he, you know, where he can get more sure. good than bad. Um, is he typical of politicians in that he has principles so he can negotiate? Or do most of the people in Congress and most of the people around them, is it that they don't have core principles and as a result they really can't negotiate or they will, they will always cut a deal or they will never cut a deal? I, it's obviously case by case, but I do think that, I mean, in, in Senator Coburn's case, he began, I mean, he's, I think he will always be known as a very principled guy. I mean, a lot of people credit him as being the father of the Tea Party, ultimately. Right. Um, but, but look, he, he is, he's actually quite independent. I mean, he mm -hmm. has a friendship with Barack Obama that right. seems pretty genuine. Um, and also, he has a level of credibility now, just probably by his seniority, but also the fact that he gets a lot of attention, is his own ecosystem that allows him to be pragmatic and maybe deal more than he would. He also has term limited himself right. in a way that um, most people sometimes will, will, don't mean. I mean, he yeah. will not run beyond he, his term. Ending. Well, and he had, of course, term loaded himself as a congressman. And he and said when him. he was leaving that, you know, only right. psychotics want to be here. <laughs> And then came back a few years later. So, well, but in the CIA, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, that does tend to work. Um, well, you know, I guess to continue on this train of thought, you, uh, you know, at one point you called DC the country's most powerful, prosperous, and disappointing city. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Um, I, I think it's uh, well, certainly it's powerful, and it's the seat of the federal government. It's prosperous for, for all the reasons I just mentioned. I mean, it's doing exceedingly well. Uh, it's disappointing. I mean, just if you talk to most Americans or look at polls and they talk about, I mean, if they were, you were to ask them to talk about the performance of their government, Democrats, Republicans, the media, I mean, just the whole D.C. establishment. Do you have a sense among the media or among D.C. people or, or the great uh, American masses, are people disappointed that government is not doing things or that they're not doing the right things? Probably a combination yeah. of both. I, I think, though, one thing I came away with is the system here, the machinery here has gotten so big and the lie has gotten so baked into the day-to-day -day conversation, whether it's, yeah, I didn't mean that term limits thing, or I didn't mean that corporate donations thing, or I didn't mean that no lobbying in the White House thing, because here's an exception here. Right. There, there's a level that over time, I mean, look, everyone can make a living, everyone can do what they want, everyone can lie. There is a level that I think just the size and the cynicism and the, and just the, the inhumanity that has grown up Can here. we talk a little bit about, because Obama, President Obama is, is obviously a character in the book and you mentioned at one point Obama whose favorite movie is The Godfather and mm -hmm. who has something of a mob fetish. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that play into what you were just talking about, either the lie or the wheeling, wheeler and dealer, or the, you know, the multiple faces? Obama arguably, uh, you know, and at Reason and I think everywhere, certainly at the New York Times and Washington Post, everywhere, the Bush presidency was a disaster on every level from the, the Bush's perspective as well as everybody else. Obama was going to change all that. He was Mr. Transparent. He was shining, you know, shining prince on a horse coming into town. Mm -hmm. Terrible on transparency, terrible on right. lobbyists, you know, the right. revolving door, right. et cetera. How is he upping the game in terms of the level of cynicism and in, incapacity for taking the government seriously? Um, I think it's very possible. I mean, I think, look, he was supposed to be different, and everyone claims they're going to be different, and everyone right. claims they're going to be a change agent, and everyone claims they're going to drain the swamp, and then, you know, if, if you settle into it like a warm right. bath, great. I mean, presidents are always on a different plane, because one, they don't tend to stay. They can, yeah. they're in their own ecosystem, they can leave, they can, you know, make zillions of dollars right. doing whatever they want to do. But, no, I mean, I think Barack Obama is a incredibly pragmatic politician. He's an incredibly astute politician. I mean, I think the godfather analogy, which he's used himself, is, is right, which is that he, he sees this maybe as a Machiavellian game. I mean, I think he has ideals. I think he believes a lot of what he says, but I think ultimately 
Uh, he is a player of the game, and he's been very, been very effective. What is the way, and uh, not to drain the swamp, but maybe to ratchet down the level of cynicism uh, and disbelief in government, both you know, both among the voters, but then especially among people in the system, right? Because if right. they're if they're believing everybody's full of shit, everybody's lying, no, words don't mean anything. Right. Then nothing can change. How do you, how do you make how do you affect a change? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm not a solutions and change guy. I mean, I, I don't know, but I think that look, my journalistic formula, and a lot of people have said, where's your conclusion? What are your ten right. your prescriptions? My journalistic formula is shining a light on maybe the culture and maybe shame ultimately. I mean, I think. Look, I mean, I, what I try to do is give voice to the entire carnival here and sort of to try to give readers outside of Washington who might have an intuitive sense that Washington is not a great place these days, a fuller sense of what the, the full movie looks like. If it is, I mean, this is kind of a systems approach. Right. It doesn't matter what widget shows up here. It's going to come out looking the same after a couple of years. Yeah. So then how do you, I mean, that really does beg right. for what's wrong with the system and then who, you know, are we looking, if we're looking in D.C. Mm -hmm. for the architect of the system and how mm -hmm. to control or how to change it, maybe that's the wrong place. Maybe. Well, I, I think what, that's an interesting yeah. point because I think if you do, I mean, one of the, the sources of optimism that I feel in the course of my job, mm -hmm. and, and people say I'm a cynic, or people say I tear down the city and, and whatever. I mean, I, I, my wife at least thinks I'm an optimist. Um, one source of optimism is that I get to leave Washington periodically. Mm -hmm. My job allows me to leave Washington. Um, and, and look, populist movements are easily dismissed here, but they can be very, very powerful. Um, I mean, I guess the recent example is, I mean, gay marriage, immigration. I mean, we wouldn't be having these conversations here if it weren't for the, the, where the numbers are mm -hmm. out in the country. Yeah, drug legalization as well is another case where these, these are things that are happening out, well outside of the yeah, metro, so right. the and, metro area. And that eventually, whether it's shame or just pragmatism, mm -hmm. will drive Washington you know, to, to some kind of movement. I, I think, though, what, what I'm focusing on here is, again, to shine a light on that permanent feudal class, to, to give people a fuller sense I guess you would say of the horror. Well, we will leave it there. We've been talking with Mark Leibovich, who's the author of the, uh, I'm trying to give it the due credit it deserves, entertaining, irresistible, heartbreaking, uh, stomach churning. That's false. Mark Leibovich, the, uh, the author of This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral, plus plenty of valet parking in America's gilded capital. Yeah. Thanks so much for talking to Reason TV. Right. Thanks, Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. it.